getting started in a couple of moments. If you cannot hear me very well or cannot see the screen, the slides on the screen, please try to refresh your browser. If you are encountering any difficulties during the session, feel free to refresh or close your browser and reopen the link. Usually takes about 30 seconds or so. My name is Chanel Blackwood. I'm the marketing manager at IKEA. Welcome and thank you for registering for today's webinar. Where is gender in health economics? Today's webinar was made possible through a grant through the International Development Research Center, IDRC. Today's webinar will be translated from English to French. If you prefer to listen in French, feel free to adjust your language at the bottom of your screen. That is on the right-hand side. The webinar will run for approximately 60 minutes and we'll be providing recording posted on the IHEA website in English and French afterwards. Just a couple of housekeeping items before we get started. If you encounter any tech difficulties, you can reach our tech support by clicking on the question mark button in the bottom left hand corner of the screen. If you are using a mobile app, you can access tech support through the menu. Everyone on the line except for our speakers are muted. You can feel free to unmute yourself during the question period or use the chat box function at the bottom of your screen. I'll now pass things over to our moderator today. Dai, Dai, over to you. Thanks, Chanel. Um, so as not to waste any time, maybe we could just go on to the next slide. Um, and um, I just wanted to welcome everyone to this webinar and thank you very much for joining us live. Uh, my name is Di McIntyre. I'm the Executive Director of IHEA. And before introducing um, the webinar and the speakers, I just wanted to briefly acknowledge IDRC. Well, Chanel also did that, um, but it's, it's due to them that we're able to have simultaneous translation of uh, this and other webinars. Um, this webinar is incredibly important for IHEA. IHEA is committed to equality, diversity, and inclusion, and gender is really a critical part of that. And we committed not only to ensuring GDI, uh, EDI within um, the association and its structures, but also in promoting research that includes an EDI and particularly a gender lens. And uh, my sense is that uh, gender lens has been neglected in health economics research, and we're hoping that this webinar will be the start of ending this neglect. Um, Chanel, next slide, please. Um, now, just to introduce our amazing speakers, we really are incredibly fortunate to have um, the top people in the field of um, gender and health. And uh, first, who will speak is, is Velochny Govender from WHO. She's a health economist and she's got considerable experience of gender and equity in health and health systems. Our next speech, speaker will be Lavanya Vijayasingham, who's at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. And she's an interdisciplinary global health researcher who's under taken research on a wide range of issues, but with gender as a core strand. Um, the third speaker will be Raja Lakshmi Ramprakash, who's with the Public Health Foundation of India, and she's a health system researcher and human rights activist with vast experience in gender equity and ethics in health and health systems. And last but not least is Michelle Remy, who is currently with the Global Fund to Fight AIDS, Tuberculosis and Malaria. And she's a health economist who's been very involved in knowledge sharing and policy engagement around gender equality in health. So without any more delay, uh, Chanel, if I could ask you to bring up uh, the main slides and hand over to Veloshni. And I'm very much um, looking forward to this hearing everyone's contribution.
Okay. I'm okay. Um, can I move to the next slide? Can I do that myself? Oops. Chanel, okay. So our objective um, through platforms such as this webinar is not to not only provoke and stimulate discussion and inquiry on the topic of gender and gender analysis in health economics, but also to encourage research and build, on the, build the evidence across diverse settings on this uh, important topic. And my role today, before handing over to my colleagues, Lavanya, um, uh, Michelle, and uh, Rajalakshmi, who will delve, delve into specific examples of how incorporating a gender analysis in specific topics of health economics can deepen our conceptual understanding on the role of gender, but also advance research approaches and analyses it's, just, it's to also provide an overall context for, for why gender, like income inequality, cannot be, be neglected in health economics research. So therefore, if there's one take-home message you take from this webinar, is not whether, we, whether gender should be incorporated in health economics research, but how. Can you move to the next slide for me, please? Thank you. So let, let's just take a step back and examine the wider context. Given that the majority of the world's poor are women, gender equality is high on the global uh, development agenda. And this is reflected in SDG 5, which focuses on achieving gender equality and empowering all women and girls. Next slide, please. And relevant for this audience is that the significance of gender equality as a core development objective in its own right and its linkages with economic inequality has predated the Sustainable Development Goals and is reflected in the World Development Report in 2012 on gender equality and development. And the report identified four areas for public action, including those related to health outcomes, as well as education and empowerment. Could you move to the next slide? So before we progress further, it's important to at least set the scene up for how we understand and how we incorporate gender in our own work. So unlike sex, which is labeled, which is a label that's assigned at birth, and usually by a doctor based upon body parts, genes, and hormones that one is born with, gender is a social construct of how society thinks we should look, think, and act as girls, women, boys, and men, with implications for access to information, opportunities for education and employment, to name but a few. And increasingly, gender and intersectionality is receiving increasing attention across many domains of health research, including health systems research, in recognition that while all women will experience gender discrimination across their lifetime, it is not just gender, but also race, socioeconomic class, and other factors or other social determinants which shape exposure to social and health risks, including in my own area of work, namely sexual and reproductive health. And this includes gender-based violence, unintended pregnancies, forced marriage, and female genital mutilation, to, to name but a few. And also increasingly important is the importance of understanding gender and masculinity. So for in terms of our own areas of work, we, while we do not uh, focus on, on masculinity, it is an increasingly important area. Can we move to the next slide? Thank you. While we have observed from our own areas of work that there is encouragingly a growing body of gender analysis that's incorporated in health and health systems research. And this is reflected in research questions, research methods, data collection processes, et cetera, as well as gender specific research, which considers inequality arising from unequal gender norms and practices. However, when we turn to health economics and specifically reflecting on the fields of interest under the, you know, the Health Economic Association and that are, that are listed, there is insufficient or an absence of gender analysis. So given the, the limited time for this webinar, we will focus on two areas of health economics and illustrate how an inclusion of gender analysis, conceptual and methodologically, can de deepen our understanding of, of gender and a deeper understanding of questions under, under research. So under healthcare and financing, we have two presentations today which will apply a gender analysis to health insurance. Firstly, with respect to employment-based health financing, Levani will argue that application of a gender analysis to employment-based health financing reveals that gender, gender equity in access to healthcare will not be achieved 
when women's health entitlements are linked to the employment status. Turning to a state-sponsored um, insurance scheme in India, Raja Lakshmi will look at the, the question of uh, eligibility under uh, the insurance scheme and the question around financial protection against catastrophic health expenditure, and in the process, test the underlying assumptions of gender neutrality in a publicly financed health insurance scheme. And in our final presentation on economic evaluation, Michelle argued that economic evaluation is not gender neutral in several areas, including analysis of provider and patient costs, productivity losses, and decision rules, to name but a few. Can you just go to the next slide, please? Thank you. And before handing over to Levania, uh, as by way of illustration, here are a few examples of gendered questions for health financing in the context of universal health coverage. And this is drawn from a publication for UN Women on Universal Health Coverage, Gender Equality and Social Protection. And this is demonstrates just about a few, few type of questions that can be addressed when we're looking at health financing. Thank you. And I will now hand over to Levania. Hello everyone, I hope you're doing well. I'll be speaking today about this article that is also co-authored by Dr. Veloshni and Michelle on this panel and Professor Sophie Witter on employment-based health financing and how it does not serve gender equity and even more broadly, health equity and the pursuit of health for all. So here are some definitional points before we get into it. We refer to employment-based health financing as any scheme or program that links health entitlements, that is coverage, benefits, caps of use to a person's employment status, type, and financial contributions. Now, in many cases, it is based on pooled contributions from an employee, the employer, and, and or the state, which are then channeled to service providers for a defined set of health entitlements to the contributing individuals and sometimes their dependents. Uh, countries that use or have used versions of this approach include Thailand, Ghana, Mexico, South Korea, Vietnam, South Africa, and of course, the US. Now, there's a couple of problems with this approach, and I'm going to start with the last bullet point here. That is, healthcare is a human right. It's not an employment benefit. Health for all means that everyone that needs healthcare resources should be able to access it when and where they need it. However, lots of employment-based systems are designed to provide more entitlements to those in higher hierarchical positions or those who can afford and want to pay higher premiums. Employment-based systems, now though a useful resource mobilization approach, can undermine this aspiration and ideal. Employment and income is by no means static. It is dynamic and changes with time throughout our lives. This makes employment-based systems an unstable and fragmented source of access or financing for both individuals and health systems at national levels. This approach is particularly unstable when a crisis hits at both personal and or national levels, especially where there's also a higher health need, such as that which we observed during the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, considering that the employment sector has extensive gender inequalities all around the world, as Veloshni has just spoke about, and when we build upon this unequal foundation as a dominant mechanism of health access, we convert those dynamics into further health inequities that different women around the world already face. So let's look at the work changes across a woman's life. Depending on her socioeconomic and cultural context, she is subject to a mix of voluntary and involuntary work transitions that's paid work, unpaid care work, having children, raising children, cutting back on work hours, maybe switching between roles, between formal, informal, and the non-standard sectors, such as in this gig economy. But what does all this mean for her health access when there are different schemes with different terms of coverage and benefits and final financial protection? The question here, do women 
different types of women that sit within and between various intersectional categories have continuous access to the health care they need across their lives? Or is she invisible that she is lost in the gaps? Do employment systems keep pace with and adapt with the fast-changing gender trends of the local and global employment ecosystem? So women are more prone to non-standard work, such as part-time, temporary, and crowdsourced work, where there are higher income gaps and lesser employment protections, including different terms of healthcare coverage. In South Korea, for example, there are different schemes for full-time and non-standard workers. In Vietnam and Thailand, there are different terms and entitlements for dependence between schemes. Women perform more than 80% of unpaid care, and yet these activities are often undervalued in health systems. Women in low- and middle-income countries, in Asia and Africa particularly, are highly concentrated in, in the informal sector with lower pay, less regular income, and often no social protection. This means that they have a lower ability to make regular payments for voluntary contributions, voluntary contributions based um, on informal sector health schemes. So in a way, the points we make in this paper is broader than even the, the, the gender conversation. It's also about um, equity considerations beyond socioeconomic position and income, transitions in life, be it employment status, income, life roles, or other circumstances should not a change in individuals' access to adequate, high-quality, and timely health care. These are often the times when there may be a higher need for health care resources, in fact. In Mexico, for example, there's a difference in formal and informal sector health schemes, which, me which meant that transitions between these schemes, um, which women are more prone to, have shown uh, changing levels of access to quality health care which then also causes negative impacts on health outcomes. Uh, women are by no means a heterogeneous group. We vary by so many ever-changing intersectional categories, uh, age, country of residence and migration, uh, disability and chronic illness. In some countries, those with pre-existing illnesses may need more to access the healthcare resources but are conferred less healthcare or are required to pay higher premiums. The catch here is that they also may be limited by their illness to work in full-time roles or in higher paying, fast-paced and stressful roles. So women, in chronic illness, women with chronic illnesses or disabilities face this double burden. Like in the movie Purple Hearts on Netflix, and my, my apologies for any spoilers if you've not watched this yet, a young woman with type 1 diabetes working in the gig economy in the U.S. resorts to marrying a friend in the Navy just so she can get spousal entitlements for health care because she could not afford it on her own terms. Of course, this is also documented in research. Women with a history of breast cancer tend to have lesser days off work to avoid work loss if they depend on their own health care insurance compared to those who have spousal entitlements. So here's the action call. Here are some design tweaks to consider, if it's not already in place, to be more gender responsive to the needs of them. Number one, parallel schemes should aim to confer continuous access to everyone with equitable levels of quality, benefits, and financial protection to everyone. Number two, UHC design and policy reforms must include the pursuit of gender equity. Gender bias design, such as benefits packages that don't meet women's needs across schemes and gender-based premium pricing that should be avoided. Unpaid care work should be more equally valued in financial protection and benefit design. And lastly, invest in research and utilize findings in policy change and system design. Understand and address contextual factors and local needs 
in innovative and purposeful ways. Thank you. Uh, so in the next 10 minutes, I'm going to rush and debunk the gender neutrality assumptions uh, underlying the publicly funded health insurance scheme. Uh, this is based on my doctoral work in the Southern Indian state of uh, Tamil Nadu. Next slide. Uh, since I'll be speeding up, I thought I'll just, uh, next one, please. Uh, I'll be, uh, this is a slide which has the publications which discuss the different aspects of the gender dimensions of publicly funded health insurance scheme. If some of you want to look it up later. Next slide, please. Uh, the context is that uh, out-of-pocket expenditures have been pushing a substantive number of households in a lower and lower middle income countries into poverty. And India, of course, uh, uh, contributes a large share to this. And this is not surprising given that India has been uh, spending a meager amount in terms of health budget and health spending. And when the rally for universal health coverage uh, uh, picked up momentum, India's response was to introduce these forms of publicly funded health insurance schemes to ensure financial protection. Uh, publicly funded health insurance schemes or PFHIS, PFHIS, that's how I'll be referring to it from now on, aims to provide financial protection against catastrophic health expenditure for the below poverty line income group. And this is done through a mechanism of prepayments where the government upfront pay premium to the insurers who then reimburse the cost of healthcare treatment, access to a network of empaneled public and private hospitals. One has to remember the design of these schemes is such that only high-end and tertiary level care are mostly covered with some uh, secondary level care too. Since 2008, uh, some of the uh, states in India have been experimenting with their own state-sponsored health insurance scheme. And later, uh, the national level scheme uh, merged all of them together. And it is now called as uh, PMJY or Pradhan Mantri Jana Arogya Yojana, which covers almost all states and union territories except three or four. Next slide, please. So uh, the motivation for uh, why to look at gender in these schemes comes from the fact that gender power relations are embedded not just in households and communities, communities, but also in the health systems and policy. We can see this through the lack of gender disaggregated data. We see that most of the UHC schemes are analyzed through the uh, WHO cube framework, which doesn't render easily to gender equity analysis. And when households are used as the primary unit for measuring catastrophic health counts or consumption expenditures, it's missing and it's making in intra-household dynamics invisible. So in the early uh, stages of these uh, publicly funded health insurance schemes, there were reports of mass hysterectomies being done in private hospitals on uh, low income and poor women under the insurance scheme. There were studies which said if uh, the RSBY had a maximum ceiling of only five members per household who can be enrolled, then mostly women are being excluded. Utilization patterns were indicating that most of the beneficiaries are men and not women. And the awareness levels of women on insurance schemes was uh, much uh, lower than that of men. So next slide, please. So my doctoral study started with uh, the kind of questions which, was, which will first look at gender differences in the actual healthcare expenditures, insurance enrollment and utilization, which can be qualified as unfair and avoidable because uh, some of it could be due to the biological and other uh, natural reasons, but what are those differences which are unfair and avoidable? And what are the mechanisms and process by which some women are able to flow upstream and access benefits of these insurance schemes and some are not able to? And did these uh, publicly funded health insurance scheme address the financial barriers that women have and some non-financial barriers too? And overall, uh, does the design and implementation and evaluation of such schemes indicate some unintended effects, whether positive or negative? Next slide, please. So my study was uh, based uh, in the southern state of Tamil Nadu. Uh, and I looked 
uh, uh, at the Chief Minister's Comprehensive Health Insurance Scheme, and that is the name of the scheme in Tamil Nadu. Now, Tamil Nadu is one of the most progressive states with very good health indicators, a strong public health system, and the dominant private health system. Yet, my study showed how uh, you know the scheme was mostly uh, wearing the coat of uh, gender neutrality, and if you uh, scratch the surface and dig in deep, there were many gender-blind aspects. The study first started off with a huge amount of secondary data coming from national surveys, from the insurance data spanning three years, and the website. And then I started to go into the field into one rural impoverished area and a rural impoverished uh, uh, urban and rural areas uh, with a survey and then followed up with 50 odd interviews with uh, hospitalized men and women uh, who have or have not used the insurance scheme. Next slide, please. Right. So I've organized the results by uh, in the format of three assumptions, which I would like to uh, debunk here. Next slide. The first assumption is with respect to enrollment. So we assume that if the five member ceiling, which was in the earlier scheme, is removed and if the household is enrolled, then all female and male members of the household would be automatically enrolled too. But the study found that there were households which actually need this financial protection who get left out of the scheme simply because they do not have what is called as the ration cards. The ration cards are nothing but the public distribution cards to give away food subsidies. And this is how the below poverty line is uh, demarked by the government in Tamil Nadu. We find that migrants or uh, you know, extremely important payment dwellers and uh, generations of families where uh, there is no registered marriages and people really living in the family, uh, the mainstream family uh, structures are uh, left out. Uh, women and uh, social groups which are down uh, in the uh, social ladder also lack awareness and uh, financial resources to actually land up in the enrollment camps and produce the necessary documents and go through the entire, entire enrollment process. And uh, there are women who do have their names on the ration cards, but they have been victims of domestic violence and have got separated from their spouse who cannot actually access these cards. And one should also remember that this enrollment into the insurance scheme, there's a single card given for the entire family. So if they are kicked out, they have no chance of actually accessing the benefits of the scheme. Transgender persons who uh, come out of the family are also facing the same challenge. Uh, women, when they get married and simply because their address changes from the uh, natal home to the marital home, also get left behind because their names are not yet incorporated in the uh, new ration cards. So, for, the, for example, in the study, around 14.3% 14, 14 of those who were not enrolled actually cited the lack of documentation as the main reason. Next, please. The second assumption I would like to uh, uh, debunk here is that we assume that once the household is enrolled, then both the male and the female members have equal access to uh, health care treatment using that card. However, the study found that the burden of unpaid care work was an immense challenge for women because they have to organize substitutes to take care of their regular household care work. They have to organize a female attendant to take care of them when they are in the hospital. The second thing is many sexual reproductive health concerns, uh, such as abortions, contraception, infertility, etc., are not covered in the insurance scheme because insurance is typically for high-end and low probability events, whereas these are recurring and even small amounts can be catastrophic for women. The hospitals which were empaneled in the scheme, they were not preferred by women because they were far away or uh, they, uh, the ones which they really trusted were not empaneled. And uh, for every hospitalization, women had to negotiate and bargain within the household to uh, get the finances organized before they can actually go and get their uh, health care needs. The, even when all the other circumstances were favorable, women themselves valued their health needs and ration the card and its benefits for the male members in the family and for the younger children. So if you looked at the three years of insurance data, only 35% of all the claims under this scheme came from women. That's, that's a really uh, small proportion. And if you look at the claims coming from the scheduled castes and tribes, with the, which are the historically disadvantaged groups in India, it was a mere 6.1%. 6 the last assumption, next slide please. The last assumption I would like to debunk here is that we assume, uh, next slide please, yeah, uh, thank you. 
so we assume that once an enrolled woman takes the card and goes to the hospital for the treatment that is covered uh, then she's protected from the out of pocket expenditures and distress coping but no firstly women spend very less on their health which has been shown from the primary data and from the sample survey uh, um, details data and even when using the card the study found that 8 out of the 28 uh who used the card reported that they had to pay upfront cash advances to the hospitals and they were not given cashless treatment and the private hospitals often picked which patients could use the card and for what amount so this means that in spite of the card these households actually uh, uh spent uh, from pocket for all the other costs that were not covered under the insurance and once there were these uh, heavy health expenditures the impact on women was from what different from then the impact of men in that women sold their uh, jewels the cattle and went to their uh, parents families and families uh, to uh, organize the resources some of them made their children drop out of education and took up additional work next slide please so uh, what i would like to sum up here is that uh, when we speak of out of pocket expenditures or distress coping or catastrophic headcount whose experiences are we really talking about whose experiences have we captured are we assuming all the members of the family are going through the same kind of experiences and they have the same thresholds for distress coping etc and if women are not even accessing health then what does a lower out of pocket expenditure actually mean because this cannot be considered in vacuum and this is very important while evaluating the health financing scheme and publicly funded health insurance schemes like cmchs or pmjay they wear the coat of gender neutrality but actually speaking they are blind to the gender based barriers that occur in the implementation design etc which decides that very few actually get some benefit out of it and the gender blindness also causes a lot of unintended consequences for example hysterectomy has been topping the chart of such insurance schemes from 2010 to even as recent as 2019 and we still do not know how many of these are rational and needed and how many are not and the cherry picking which was earlier only a private provider behavior is now seeping into the public health systems because there's revenue coming from insurance models so now even public hospitals want to select which of the patients that they will serve which is a very perverse unintended effect of such scheme next slide and the last slide is therefore what is my appeal to this audience and health economists is that we need to develop frameworks and tools which will help us to generate evidence on the intra household experiences income alone cannot be a criteria to define vulnerability for uh, health uh, expenditures and uh, universal health coverage plans should explicitly identify what are the gender based barriers in each of its plan and focus on all the other intersecting determinants of health in every stage right from design implementation and evaluation Thank you. Um, Wagadugu, uh, where I'm joining you from today. Um, it's really an honor to be here and to share some thoughts on gender in economic evaluation. Um, please do give me a, a shout if if there are any problems with the connection. But um, I'll assume otherwise that you are you're hearing me. Um, so I, um, following on Raj's uh, myths, which I really liked, I, I wanted to to say that. I think that tends to be a similar myth in economic evaluation that that economic evaluation is an objective, independent, sort of free of biases, and by extension is gender neutral. And I just want to speak a little to some ways in which gender biases are likely to, or even have been demonstrated to change uh, economic evaluation results. But I will mainly use my limited time to focus on how the limitations of the standard single outcome framework of Uh, economic evaluation affects the decisions that would be taken around investments in interventions that try to address gender inequalities and gender inequities more broadly in health. And I will also go beyond, try to go a bit beyond the analytical deficits to also share some work on how we can and and should try to innovate and adapt our economic evaluation me methods to overcome this limitation and, and the biases. So, um, if we can go to the uh, next slide, please. So first, here are some of the gender biases and gender differences that influence the different analytical components of economic evaluation. 
So on the cost side, for example, healthcare costs can differ and have been found to differ for some, some interventions by gender. And therefore, they could lead to different cost effectiveness results with, with if you would look at, uh, if you disaggregate the analysis and have some sex specific cost effectiveness analysis. And not taking these into account in some cases may mean that the, an intervention that may be more cost effective for one gender may be undervalued um, without the analysis. And that here's an example from, from stroke um, date costing data, for example. But there are also more deep-seated sort of structural gender inequalities that we can be re replicating in our costing analysis. So, for example, the societal undervaluation of women's healthcare work is going to be reflected in the financial costs of provision. So we know that women are sub so. Then, sorry, just on the health workforce, just I was flagging here that we are um, in the in the estimates the financial costing of interventions, we are in, in, internalizing the um, undervaluation of women's health care work. Um, we know that there's 70% of the health workforce, there's still a pay gap. And I was flagging that for community health workers, we've seen, for example, who are female dominated in many settings and are underpaid, in some cases even unpaid, um, this often leads to conclusions that the interventions with community health workers are highly cost effective, which I think they, they probably are, but these estimates embed this undervaluation. And I think it has important implications, I was just saying, because I've heard policymakers say that, oh, well, you know, then we should just keep community health workers since we can pay them less and that will make it more cost effective. Um, so just, just bearing these, these issues and policy implications um, in mind. Then I was saying on the health-related quality of life side, there are gender differences also in, in uh, quality of life disability for different states, but often cost effectiveness analysis tends to take averages and blur these differences. So for example, there are differences in disutility that's associated with pain, which is increasingly recognized. There's lower functioning uh, quality of life scores for some conditions. Um, and that means that by not considering these differences, then interventions that, for example, reduce pain could be undervalued. Uh, for, for women's health uh, outcomes and for, from that perspective. Um, in term, there's another example from Zambia, for example, where there's some impact modeling done of a sugar tax, which found overall no significant health impacts of the intervention. But then when they disaggregated the analysis by sex, it actually revealed significant impacts uh, for women's health and so led to a different conclusion. Uh, the, the other component is these indirect uh, health impacts on, fam on the family members. And this is rarely taken into account in economic evaluation, and I, I, I'd love to be wrong, um, but I, I think this often due to the, you know, these different gender roles that we know um, are, are a reality in many contexts. There's a, the loss of a, or reduced functioning of a woman where she's the primary household care can have significant indirect impacts on the health, health of household members, but we, we don't usually factor those in. Um, on productivity losses, I was saying similarly to the issues Lavania raised, economic productivity internalizes gender inequality in the labor market uh, in terms of gender wage differentials, gender discrimination in employment. Um, so when we are looking at gender specific interventions, we might be undervaluing them because of these underlying um, inequalities. And the last category I wanted to speak to and want to speak to more actually is the decision rules. So once we have the results of our analyses, we have our cost effectiveness ratio, for example, how we use it alongside decision rules to make recommendations can also be problematic, uh, especially for health interventions that also have gender equality outcomes. So for these types of interventions, they tend to be undervalued by our common methods. Um, and we, we might be giving incorrect advice to decision makers because we are only considering um, our health specific outcome. Um, so I want to speak, so if you can go to the next slide this time and just make sure we're all still together. <laughs> yes. Um, I, so here I wanted to, to speak a little bit more about those types of structural interventions that are trying to address deep social biases and inequalities, um, because those are, those are really important ones that we need if we want to address these issues and we'll need to consider action at this level. So I like this illustration of what it means for health to act at the structural level. Now, typically, we think of determinants of disease and health as sort of biological, behavioral, and structural. And then we have associated uh, responses or interventions, which are biomedical, um, educational, and, and uh, clinical, and, and finally structural. And so for these structural um, interventions, which is clearly where um, a, a lot of gender-related issues will, will fall, even though there are many, many in the others as well. Uh, but if we focus on this one, 
What this means is that we move from approaches that assume high personal volition towards approaches that assume low personal volition. So for example, HIV infections are, are high, considerably higher among adolescent girls and young women in, in uh, high burden countries in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and so clearly gender inequality is playing a role. Now, a structural intervention to prevent these infections could be to keep girls in school and thereby reduce their exposure to older sexual partners. Now, if you move to the next slide, this was, um, in fact, uh, this was tested in Malawi, uh, and they, uh, it was a cash transfer program that gave us a monthly stipend to households and adolescent um, girls directly as well. And they found just after just 18 months of implementation, they found a range of positive outcomes among girls um, who were in school at baseline. And that included you know, reductions in school dropout, early marriage, teen pregnancies. And then there was the 64 reduction in HIV, um, prevalent HIV. And so the study authors then did a rough uh, cost effectiveness analysis and estimated this range of five to $12,500 per, per um, HIV infection averted. Now, compared to other HIV prevention interventions, this wasn't considered to be cost effective. So the decision rule here would dictate that it was not a worthwhile HIV investment. Now, given all the other benefits of this intervention, it seemed we, we did some work with colleagues at, at the London School and at UNDP to dig into this a bit further and demonstrated that there was a problem with this decision rule. If you could go to the next slide, please. So here you see we monetized um, the, all these different benefits with each payer's cost effectiveness threshold, which is meant to reflect their marginal productivity and budget constraint. And we showed that while the intervention would not be prioritized by a single payer, it could be prioritized if the payers co-financed the intervention. So their decision rule would, would change to, yes, fund the intervention if other, uh, others share the costs and the remaining cost is below the, the payer's cost effectiveness threshold. And, and then the full value of the intervention for these adolescent girls and young women could be taken into account and the financing decision resulting uh, in the financing decision resulting from the economic evaluation. So next slide, please. There's a slightly different way to illustrate the very, very similar um, point, um, which is uh, using Collier's bookshelf me metaphor. So here the intervention, health interventions are ranked by their health productivity from left to right. And they are funded until the health budget is exhausted. So this, this red line. Um, and unlike the other books, we only have health benefits. You can see this blue book has, uh, let's say, multiple benefits, health, both health and, in this case, uh, education benefits. Um, and this one would not make the, make the cut because of, of its health productivity. And next slide. The same would be true if you uh, look at the, the bookshelf um, Sorry, next slide. From the education uh, sector's perspective, you know, the education sector in this case could also be the gender um, equality sector. Um, sorry, but uh, interventions. But then uh, this, if you um, actually consider that the two, you know, there would be a potential uh, financing solution uh, that if we assume health and education um, benefits, for example, are equal and the costs would, could be cut by half, then suddenly the health productivity per health dollar spend would double. And the black area here shows the health benefits that we would lose if we did not actually take this approach and did not consider to co-finance. And now suddenly intervention five would replace would be replaced by intervention six to prevent this health loss. Um, and similarly, uh, next slide, you would the same would be true for the the other sector, um, who, which would also now not experience this this loss. Um, and so the co-financing and this basically this different decision rule could prevent welfare loss for both sectors. Um, next slide. So uh, you know, often this raises the question of why, well, why don't you just do a cost-benefit analysis to address this multiple outcomes issue and that that might be better suited for some of these uh, gender responsive interventions as well. So we did a, a um, with my co colleague Anna Vassel at the, at the London School, we did some comparative analysis of these different approaches. And I, I won't say too much about this because I know my time is up. Um, but I just wanted to highlight that in the next slide. Uh, that what, what comes out very strongly is that the, the underlying assumptions and the value positions of these different approaches will influence what's best suited for the decision maker. And what's relevant for gender here is that they, there are normative assumptions about the initial distribution of societal resources and whose preferences should determine value of outcomes um, is, is strongly Im embedded. And there's also this question of should the health sector also have non-health mandates? So does a health decision maker have the mandate to promote gender equality? 
Um, I would say yes, but it, not, not others may, may, may disagree. So my concluding remarks, next slide, are up here. Um, yeah, so just to, uh, maybe I'll just leave it there because I realize I got cut with the connection, but just wanted to say that, I, you know, current methods don't acknowledge the gender equality benefits and undervalue some of these upstream interventions uh, that are more gender responsive. There have been a lot of methodological advancements, uh, advancements to consider multiple objectives, uh, including equity, like extended cost effectiveness analysis, distributional cost effectiveness analysis. But I've seen very limited applications of these that consider gender inequity. And I, I hope I'm wrong and I'm missing something. Um, but I think there's a need for more methodological work and normative frameworks that really incentivize more analyses that question and do not replicate uh, embedded gender biases. So I will um, leave the, the quote up here and, and thank you. Sorry for the connection problem.